Now, this is the episode that I've been really looking forward to delving into. Episode 6 of Band of Brothers, which is titled Bastone, is a real standout when it comes to the 10 episodes that make up the miniseries. Following immediately after what we saw at the end of Episode 5, where the 101st Airborne Division were heading towards Bastone, within this episode we followed Eugene Rowe, a medic, as ZZ Company were planted in unforgiving conditions where they didn't have the right protective clothing, enough supplies, or enough force to hold the line. With the environment being just as much of an enemy as the Germans that were on the other side of the line, this is definitely one of my favourite episodes for a number of different reasons. So let's not wait any longer and let's get into this episode and break down all that there was to take away from it. Here is a breakdown of Band of Brothers Episode 6, Bastone. Just to let you know, this video will contain spoilers. The Interviews As in every episode of Band of Brothers, other than the finale, this episode started with interviews. But what was particularly interesting about this set of interviews compared to the previous few episodes was that it was centered around a situation that was in front of the men. Prior to this episode, the past few had been about emotions and traits of individuals and how they overcame them. There was leadership with regards to Captain Winters, fear with regards to Blythe, and also how other people handled it. But now, deep into the show, past the halfway point, it's like we almost know how these men were feeling, and it was time for the show to focus on the harsh conditions and environment that they were in. Something which we knew would have naturally brought all of those emotions and traits to the forefront anyway. The interviewees in this episode consisted of Carwood Lipton, Lester Hashi, Earl McClung, Hank Zimmerman, Herbert Seweth Jr. and J.B. Stokes. Each of these men were describing their time in Bastogne, the place we saw the 101st Airborne Division heading towards at the end of Episode 5. We heard that they were underprepared, that the Germans knew where they were, and that it was just all-out chaos due to the fog that was refusing to lift. Supplies wouldn't even drop for them, and they would sometimes even drop over the line, meaning the Germans would get them. However, there were two lines of dialogue amongst these interviews that stood out to me in particular. The first was spoken by Herbert Seweth Jr., and he said, And then a medic came along, and I think he really saved my life. We didn't know at this moment in time, but the entire episode was going to be from the perspective of Eugene Rowe, a medic that was part of Easy Company. So this sentence laid down the foundations of the importance of the medics on the battlefield and everything that we go on to see in the episode. And also, the final line. J.B. Stokes said, Even today, on a real cold night, we go to bed and my wife will tell you that the first thing I'll say is, I'm glad I'm not in Bastogne. This really did lay down the foundations and allow us to imagine just how it would be when they were there. However, I don't think anything could have prepared us for the unforgiving conditions that we go on to see during the episode. I liked the approach of the interviews with this episode as it's like it almost tried to paint a picture within our mind about what it could be that we're expected to see. Hearing from the real-life veterans firsthand before going on to watch one of the best episodes in the season was something which provided that core base and understanding that we could constantly go back to throughout the entirety of the episode. When this episode opened up, the first creative decision that was made was one which made me instantly feel re-immersed back inside the world of Band of Brothers. As the episode faded from black into the picture, all we heard was the crunch of boots in the snow and the sound of breath in a way that felt difficult to do. And then when the image appeared, it was just white everywhere. It instantly got across to us that it wanted us to feel cold and it wanted us to understand that these men were quite literally freezing due to the lack of supplies and gear that they had. Amongst the sound of the snow crunching was the haunting sound of gunshots being fired in the background, there to remind us why it was that they were there. In this instance, these men weren't just fighting against the enemy, which was on the other side of the line, but they were also fighting against the weather and the conditions, meaning that this brought a new challenge when compared to the things that they'd done before. We were instantly introduced to Doc Rowe, a character that we saw brief appearances of throughout the show, such as in Episode 3 when Blythe was in the aid station, and also in Episode 5 when Moose Heiliger was fired at by his own man and he seemed stressed and frustrated with Winters. We instantly got the impression that the men were undersupplied because Eugene was going around and looking for anything that he could simply find so that he could use it on the men when they'd need him. So much so that he'd be on the cusp of walking into enemy ground and then enemies were even walking over the line into the side of the 101st. This might not have seemed that important at the time, but as the episode went on, we saw just how much the lives of the men in front of him mattered. 
They mattered to everybody, but it was evident by the end that he'd seen a lot of death and it was impacting his mind, and him searching for any kind of supplies was something which represented the care and need to alleviate that happening. We heard about the way that everything was structured, the men were essentially taking ground on one side but then ultimately losing it on the other. This showed how they were pretty much surrounded and trapped inside. Plus it also highlighted that what they were doing there wasn't really gaining any progress and the men were being put through these harsh weather conditions, in conditions where they weren't really amounting to anything because they didn't have the means necessary to be able to gain the upper hand. Within the real siege of Bastogne, the weather was one of the main things which prevented Allied aircraft from attempting to resupply Bastogne, and it also stopped the Allies from performing ground attack missions against German forces. It was said to be the worst winter weather in living memory, and I think this episode and opening section really did get that across. The sheer amount of problems that Doc Rowe was facing was something that was also made apparent. For example, Garnier said that he was peeing needles. Toy's feet were messed up due to losing his boots. Roe was looking for supplies, trying to find Doc Ryan, and also had many other people going to him with issues that they needed resolving personally, rather than due to being wounded. The fact that there was no aid station or a surgeon there was something which meant that he was having to deal with the brunt of it all. There was a line of dialogue around this section of the episode where the men were looking out over the line and they said, Do you see them? They're out there. The enemy was hidden behind the cover of fog, and although it felt like there was nobody out there because they couldn't see them, death was awaiting them if they took their eyes off of that line for a moment. Again, showing us just how much the weather conditions played an important role in Bastogne, which ultimately went against them in that moment. At around the 11 minute mark of the episode, there was chaos that just started ensuing in the middle of a conversation, and it was a moment where it really caught me off guard and made me jump because I just didn't expect it. It was really cleverly executed as that's what it would have most probably been like, mid-conversation and then just bang, you're fighting for your life again. After this, we were then introduced to Hephron for the first time in the episode and he was coughing. Hephron's name was Edward Hephron, but people referred to him as Babe, as during that time many of the men had nicknames, but Eugene didn't refer to him as that, something which Babe was confused and a bit frustrated by, as he said that only people such as doctors, professionals, and his mother called him by his first name. Eugene never really called anybody by their nicknames, and only called them by their first names, which was very different to many of the men that were there, and how we'd seen them act throughout the first five episodes. Again, I think this tied back into the amount of death that Doc Rowe had seen throughout his time. He was a medic, and he did visually look scarred by all of the death that he'd seen. He was almost emotionless. So by not getting that close to people to know their nicknames or truly even know their names properly, it showed that there was that level of detachment that was there. Detachment so that he wouldn't get hurt even more if the people that he got close to eventually ended up being killed. However, even though there was that sense of detachment, it didn't stop him from wanting to help the people around him. He went above and beyond. When Sisk was ultimately wounded, Eugene went back into the town with him and this was where we were introduced to Nurse Renee, a character that only appears in this episode with minimal screen time but is a memorable individual from the entirety of the show. Renee was a nurse that was in the town and was essentially going through the same difficulties that Eugene was on the front line. The nurses didn't have any supplies, death was ever present around them which was shown to us by the haunting shot of the bodies piling up outside and there was no backup beyond Bastogne, so they were quite literally isolated. Renée Le Maire was actually a real Belgian nurse that was within the aid station in Bastogne. It isn't actually known if Eugene Rowe ever met Renée in reality, which does make this story potentially fictitious, but it doesn't take away from the beauty that this story represented. Renee helped look after 150 seriously wounded soldiers per day, putting their needs first over her own, meaning she didn't get much rest or nourishment during this period. Renee and Rose's friendship that they formed in the show is one of mutual respect and how there can be care given during a time of death, devastation, and destruction. Even amongst all of it, people can still do good and the goodness in humanity can prevail. Within the show, towards the end of the episode, Renee was killed due to a bombing that occurred on Christmas Eve when it hit the aid station directly. This was something that did actually occur within reality and Renee died in that exact way. It was said that she managed to save six soldiers from the building but ended up dying when she went back to try and save the seventh. If that's not telling of the type of person that Renee Le Maire was and the hero that she was then I don't know what is. When Ro was back in Bastogne many of the men went on a hunt and advanced forward over the line but Ro was told to stay back. Whilst the men were out there fighting against the Germans, it would cut back to Rose sitting there just looking through the forest and hearing the sound of gunshots. 
He had a blank expression on his face, almost knowing that the gunshots probably represented people being killed, and him just being helpless sat there, not being able to do anything. This was where Julian was wounded and eventually killed in action and had to be left there. This was actually quite a heartbreaking moment in the episode because we've not seen somebody that was wounded being left behind before and you could feel the guilt that was present in the men that had to leave him. They knew that if they tried to get him, then they'd be killed. Hephron felt the weight of Julian's death more than most people because they were good friends. Hephron even said that if anything happened to Julian, then he'd get his belongings and send them back to his family. But obviously, he couldn't. Within reality, Julian's body was actually retrieved during nightfall, and once they had it, they asked Babe if he wanted to see his friend that was now deceased. Hephron declined seeing him because he didn't know if he could handle seeing his friend in that way. It was said that the death of Julian impacted Babe all throughout his life, even after the war. Babe never thought that Julian would be one of the men that would be killed. They both looked out for each other, and he thought that Julian was a good guy. After the war, Babe met with Julian's mother, and he broke down when he saw her. He also gave her the regimental scrapbook, which is something that he thought Julian would have wanted his mother to have. So that was one slight difference in the show, the fact that we never saw Julian's body being recovered. The conversation that took place inside of the tarpaul in the foxhole was one that I thought was quite important. We saw how Hephron was mourning his friend, how Joe had had enough of being the doctor, but we saw that Eugene hadn't had enough of being the doctor. There were probably three different mindsets that were all present in that foxhole. Even though Roe probably was done and his body language and mind was screaming that he was done, he knew that he couldn't vocalize it because it would almost make it become real if he said it out loud. After this, we were then in the final half of the episode and we saw that the fog had cleared slightly and supplies were now being dropped in the town. There was a moment where, as Eugene went into the aid station, there was a man that was in his dying moments. Eugene got involved and tried to help, but I found this to be such a haunting, helpless moment. The sound of the blood gargling, the heavy weight of the bandages that were drenched with blood as they were being thrown, and the focus on the death that was inevitably coming was just so heartbreaking to watch. Three people around one, showing that they were giving it their all to save this man, but it just simply wasn't enough. This showed the individual impact of the weight of war and how it can go on to impact the many that are around. The conversation that followed this was one where Eugene said to Renee, Your touch calms people. It's a gift from God. And she responded by saying, I never want to treat a wounded man again. She was almost vocalizing the emptiness and pain that Roe also felt inside of him at that time. But they both knew that they needed to press on and carry out what they were doing. Otherwise, more people would die. When Roe was back amongst the men, there was a moment where Smokey was hit and Eugene just absolutely froze. He wasn't responding to what was happening and didn't know what to do, as if he was just trapped inside of his own mind. Roe was quite emotionless as a character, but you do understand why when you think that he spent most of his day dealing with wounded people and people that had been killed. It was from this moment on where we saw him go more within himself. He was almost losing his sanity and becoming frozen due to the sheer amount of death that he was experiencing. It was finally getting to him, and Captain Winters was fully aware of that, Again, showing the great leadership mentality and mindset that Winters had in being able to spot it. During this episode, we also saw that Buck's partner finished with him whilst he was out there. It's something that you don't really think of, somebody breaking up with somebody when they're at war. But I imagine that was something which did happen. Buck couldn't do anything but laugh about it. This was something which was another step which led towards the mindset that we saw him have in episode 7. Ever since he was wounded in episode 4, his mindset had been changing for the worse, and he was almost like a completely different person. And I think this was just another moment that took something out of him even more. The final moments of the episode saw Harry getting hit, and following Roe helping him after again being frozen on the spot, Winters sent him into town to get a meal and to get some rest. But it was once he was there that he saw that Bastone had been bombed, and amongst the rubble he found the blue headband that Renee was wearing every time that he saw her showing that she was amongst the dead. This was a really heartbreaking moment in the episode and showed that painful reality of war, death, and the innocent casualties that can be felt. Just like we expected as well, Eugene was numb to it. You could tell that he was hurting, but it's almost like, what more could he do? Renee was another number, another casualty, another human, another person that he grew to care for that ended up dying in the war that was claiming the lives of many. When Eugene returned back alongside the men, he went over to Hephron and he called him Babe without even realizing. The first time that he'd ever called somebody by their nickname. Babe was injured at this moment and Eugene contemplated but ended up using Renee's blue headband that he took as a way of wrapping up his wound. 
This was almost a callback to the fact that Renee had a healing touch that was a gift from God, showing that she was even helping the wounded beyond her death. It was a cycle that went on and it was a stomach sinking moment. The episode finished with the way that it started, the camera moving along the snow, but this time the red of the blood contrasted with the white of the snow and an episode that was solely focused on death and the weight of it, concluded with the symbolic blood red stain on the ground being one of the final things that we saw, showing that death arrived in this episode and it will come again. The Real Eugene Rowe the real-life Eugene Rowe entered the 101st Airborne Division as a medic, but prior to the war, he didn't come from any medical background. It was said that there was a level of detachment from the camaraderie that the combat troops had, which is probably why we saw him not calling people by their nicknames. Even though that was the case, it was noted that he went above and beyond in helping the people that were wounded in the company. He'd often not get any sleep and put himself in the way of danger in order to give the best aid that he possibly could. After the war, Eugene Rowe became a construction contractor and married a woman called Vera where they had a child together. But then, after that, he then married Myrtle and had two daughters with her. Eugene Rowe died on the 30th of December 1998 at the age of 76 due to lung cancer, so sadly he was never featured in the show during the interviews. My review of the episode This episode and episode 7 are two of my favourites in the entirety of the miniseries. To be fair, everything from Bastogne onwards is exceptional, so it's a bit of a statement that doesn't carry much weight to it. I thought Shane Taylor did an incredible job at playing Doc Rowe. His detached mindset, yet wanting to help and be involved, a level of conflict that one can often feel in the mind was delivered so well. He's one of my favourite characters in the entirety of the show, and I'm glad we got to see a story from the perspective of a medic, because they were such important figures during the war. The harsh conditions that Bastone was known for having was something which was delivered so well across the screen. I genuinely felt freezing cold when I watched this episode, and I don't think I've seen a better depiction of sub-zero temperatures in a TV show or film. The sheer pain that these men felt from having to deal with the icy conditions and being under-equipped is something that I can't even begin to imagine, but this show definitely got the weight of it across. Bastone was a visually beautiful episode. It might even be the best looking episode in the entirety of the season, but that's such an important thing. The environment looks gorgeous with the white blanket of snow. It's almost romantic, but there was absolutely nothing romantic about what occurred in the Ardennes forest. So it plays with your mind when you're trying to think about how to feel. I do genuinely love this episode and it's one that I'll continue to rewatch over the years. In fact, it was the episode that I was most looking forward to rewatching when I started covering the show. Next up, we've got episode 7, which is titled The Breaking Point, which, like Bastone, is another phenomenal episode, still focused in the Arden Forest, so be sure to come back for that as it'll be released within the next week. So, there you have it, a breakdown of episode 6 of Band of Brothers. If you want to see more videos on Band of Brothers, then click on the card in the top corner. I've been covering all of the episodes from the show and I'll be covering all 10, so be sure to stick around for them. I also covered Masters of the Air and I'm thinking of doing The Pacific too, so let me know if you'd like to see breakdowns on The Pacific. Which episode is your favourite in Band of Brothers? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As always, thanks for tuning into the video and I'll see you in the next one.